from New York to our audiences worldwide on TV and on radio. This is Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We have a big show today, including interviews with Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, and also the Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy. And so let's turn first to the question of military preparedness and how it's being affected by this COVID-19 virus. That was brought home to all of us yesterday when we heard from the captain of the USS Theodore Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier, who said that he really needed to pull it, put in a port and offload all 4,000 of his sailors and have them tested because of some incidents on board the ship. It really brings home the question of how do you keep together a military force in an age of coronavirus? Well, we're going to turn to somebody now who really pays attention to military, military preparedness, not just for the United States, but for our allies as well every single day. She is Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchinson. She's the U.S. Ambassador to NATO. Before serving in that post, she was a U.S. Senator from her home state of Texas for 20 years. So, Ambassador H Hutchinson, oh, I beg your pardon. I'm now told I should go to Abigail Doolittle, and we're going to get a check on the markets because the markets are tumbling. Abigail, you there? I am, David, and they are certainly tumbling. We're looking at the S&P 500 right now down about 3.5%. And this, of course, comes after the worst quarter for the S&P 500 going back to 2008. That Russell 2000 right now down about 5%. Last quarter, the worst quarter ever. So the stock selling that we have seen this year on the coronavirus uh, crisis, the human tragedy, is continuing right into the second quarter. And, David, it really seems today to be a combination of technical factors. Some key support levels were broken uh, late yesterday, so those sellers remain in control, plus the fears around uh, the virus and as it's hitting the U.S., uh, the peak ahead in terms of what the fallout could be for the human tragedy uh, seeming to weigh on Wall Street today, David. Well, exactly, Abigail. I mean, it's not lost on me that President Trump came out yesterday after the markets had closed and said it is going to be very, very tough for at least the next two or three weeks. He said it's going to be one of the most difficult things the United States has ever faced. How much of the market reaction it doesn't have anything to do with the economy at the moment? It's really the virus itself. The virus, after all, does get a vote in the markets these days. I think you're right about that, David, just from a sentiment standpoint and also uh, from the standpoint that New York is the epicenter. That, of course, is also the heart of the financial markets here in the U.S. So certainly a toll of anxiety, fear of the unknown. I mean, we really are in an unprecedented period, so nobody knows what's next. And in terms of the peak, if it's potentially two weeks away, three weeks away, it could be further. There's just so much unknown that it really does take a psychological toll, even ahead of the possible economic impact. And of course, this week, lots of big data coming out that could also be on the minds of traders, David. Yeah, indeed. Take us cross asset a little bit. What's going on with bonds? Last time I checked, uh, people were buying bonds. It was truly risk off. That's absolutely correct. It is a risk-off day. We have Haven bonds trading higher. We also have the yen higher at this point. Uh, in pre-market, the yen had been flat, but that tells you that investors really are seeking safety. From a, a sector standpoint, all 11 sectors are down by more than 1 percent. The best sector down about 1.3 percent. The worst sector, and this is sort of interesting, David, is real estate, down 7.3 percent. And, of course, there's lots of news out there that April could be a terrible month for landlords. Um, the New York Times yesterday actually had a, an article out saying that that up to 40% of uh, New Yorkers may not pay rent. So this is weighing on the real estate sector and those apartment REITs in particular on the fears that if folks don't uh, pay rent, aren't able to pay rent from having uh, losing jobs, uh, that some of these big companies could have a problem pay pay paying loans. Some, in fact, are even saying that this health care crisis could turn into a real estate crisis. We're certainly seeing that with that real estate sector uh, down about 7% on the day. Again, the worst sector for the S&P 500. Overall, very much a risk-off picture with stocks down and bonds and the yen higher. Well, and just to underline that, you mentioned the yen being higher. At the same time, dollar, which had weakening a bit, it appears the dollar is also stronger apart from the yen right now, which would indicate people are really flooding maybe it's dollars again for safety. I would agree with you on that. And the dollar has really been quite troubling. It has been all over the map over the last month. The dollar index, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, a, a composite against the major currencies in the world, it had been well above 100 at levels not seen for quite some time, then below. That signals lots of uncertainty. But the higher the dollar goes, you're absolutely correct. It signals that investors, traders are looking for safety. So they're seeking the haven of the U.S. dollar. That, in turn, pressures uh, risk assets, such as commodities 
commodities. Oil's big tumble certainly came when oil, when the dollar was at the recent highs. It also pressures stocks. And something to keep in mind, back in 2008, there was a period of time where both the dollar and the yen together climbed. I'm not talking about the dollar yen. I'm talking about the yen itself. That was the degree of the haven bid. Right. Investors and traders, they were out of stocks and commodities to such a degree that they were uh, buying up those dollars and they were also uh, buying up yen. Uh, somebody also some also talking about the liquidity issue around this, the cash for or the dash for cash, I should say. Uh, so yes, we are seeing some dollar strength today, and that would also indicate the degree of the risk off tone. And stocks right now really at session lows. That Russell 2000 now down 5.3 percent uh, after dropping more than 30 uh, percent last quarter. So year to date down about 35 percent right now. And the S and P 500 also at session lows down 3.7 percent, close to taking out some uh, other key technical levels. And I should mention uh, the real estate sector itself has already taken out the equivalent of the S&P 500 key support levels. May suggest more weakness ahead, David. Oh, my. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. And now for Bloomberg First Word News, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. China has been lying about the extent of the corona outbreak in that coronavirus outbreak in that country. Bloomberg has learned that is the conclusion of the U.S. intelligence community in a classified report to the White House. The report found China has been underreporting total cases and the number of deaths. The outbreak began in China's Hubei province in late 2019, but the country has publicly reported only about uh, 82,000 cases and 3,300 deaths. That's according to data compiled by Johns Hopkins University. The United Nations General Assembly is weighing how to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. Members have been sent two resolutions for consideration. The most widely backed one calls for international cooperation by sharing information. The other, sponsored by Russia, calls for uh, implementing protectionist measures. Because the global body isn't holding meetings, a resolution is defeated even if one country objects. Germany has extended its nationwide lockdown until April 19th. The government is asking Germans to avoid contact with people outside their own household to contain the spread of the coronavirus. Germany has about 73,000 virus cases, the third highest in Europe. Spain reported its deadliest day yet. There were another 864 fatalities from the coronavirus. Total deaths there have now risen past 9,000. The number of confirmed cases in Spain is now above 102,000. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much to Mark. Uh, as we were saying, staying now in Europe, Spain, let's go to NATO. We are now going to speak with the ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to NATO. She is Kay Bailey Hutchinson, somebody who is watching every day for military preparedness issues affected by the coronavirus. Before serving as ambassador to NATO, uh, Ambassador Hutchinson was our uh, senator from Texas for 20-some years. So, Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your patience. We have some difficulties with some of the connections sometimes. But give us a sense of military preparedness. We heard about that with the Theodore Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier yesterday, with the captain saying they have problems there. You're not responsible for U.S. military, but you do follow the, the readiness of our troops, U.S. And, and allied, and their preparedness. Where do we stand with respect to the coronavirus? David, we are taking so we we NATO as well as we U.S. are taking uh, great precautions with our military because, of course, they are training together. They are on missions together: Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo. So uh, there are a number of measures being taken so that they, uh, if they're coming into Afghanistan, for instance, there's a 14-day quarantine. If they're coming out of Afghanistan, there's a 14-day quarantine, so they won't carry it back uh, to where they will go. So we are doing that at the military level. But I also want to say, David, that we need see now the importance of the defense spending that has happened at NATO in the last few years, uh, because we have so many assets that are helping in this humanitarian and health care crisis. You, you see right where you are right now the U.S. Navy vessel, the Comfort, which is 
now really relieving a lot of what's going to happen in New York, but we see it all over our European alliance as well. So uh, give us a sense of what that is right now. We know Italy has been particularly hard hit. What can NATO do to help a country like Italy or Spain? What we are doing is uh, giving, uh, we're, we're an information gathering and coordinating effort so that Italy is asking for supplies, certain supplies. Turkey today uh, delivered those supplies to Italy as well as to Spain. Uh, the United States is giving a, a large uh, amount to uh, Italy now and Spain and uh, several of our other allies through our uh, Supreme Allied Commander at NATO because we do have the capability to transport. Of course, uh, we know that in America, people don't have enough of the equipment, the masks, the protective gear, the uh, ventilators. So America is taking care of our own. But when we have the capacity built up, which it appears that our great entrepreneurs and scientists are doing, then we are going to immediately transfer it out uh, what is not used in America the excess will go into our alliance and our partnerships here. So we are coordinating and very active in, in the defense capabilities that are building these uh, makeshift hospitals to take the excess patients and be able to save people's lives. But we're also uh, going to be working with our entrepreneurial spirit to get more taken care of in America so we can share with our allies as quickly as possible. Ambassador Hutchinson, as you and I have talked about more than once, NATO had a set of priorities before the coronavirus came up. How does it fit the existing priorities, things like Afghanistan, things like the Middle East, with this new priority? Yes, we, we have the new priority because it is first and, and center for all of our countries. We never expected a pandemic that would affect all of us at the same time. But we are gearing up, we're dealing with it. But at the same time, David, we have uh, the foreign ministerial meeting tomorrow. All of our 30 foreign ministers will be go on video. They're not coming into Brussels, but they are on video. And we are going to be able to deliver uh, on Afghanistan, the information uh, about the peace process that America is starting and that our NATO allies are, are helping us with. And President Trump has asked for more NATO help in Iraq, and we are producing phase one tomorrow for the foreign ministers to uh, discuss, and hopefully they will approve that as well. And we're going into phase two beyond Iraq so that NATO will be able to do more in the Middle East. Um, we are keeping our core tasks that are the security tasks that we've been assigned to do. But at the same time, we are trying to divert all the assets that we can to helping ourselves and our allies in the coronavirus. What is it like to work from home as a diplomat? Is it doable? I mean, as you said, you can't have military exercises from home. But what about as a diplomat? Can you accomplish what you otherwise might virtually? You know, uh, it's not as good. I, got, I have to tell you, um, we now have gone down to only one meeting a week in person uh, with our ambassadors. Normally, we have uh, we meet four to five days a week to go over our uh, missions and what we need to do more. Now we're having one, and we're doing everything else uh, virtually. So we do a lot of negotiating. Um, on the computer, but then we come together that one time a week uh, to try to make sure that we're all on the same page. And that's how we have come to the what we're going to present to the foreign ministers tomorrow. Uh, a lot of it has been done virtually. Our staff is, is mostly working from home now, probably 60 to 70 percent are at home, even if we're in the office, and I, I have been in the office every day, but I've been able to work with our staff uh, that is not in the office because we're trying to uh, adhere to the Belgian rules, which of course have given NATO an exception because they know that we have uh, essential duties. But we are trying to help them 
uh, in their efforts to uh, contain the virus for all of us who are in Brussels now and throughout Belgium. Okay, Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for your time, and we do hope you stay safe over there in Brussels. That's Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison. She is U.S. Ambassador to NATO. Coming up here, we have Miami Mayor Suarez, who has actually survived the coronavirus, but he has a hot spot in Miami right now. That's coming up next on Bloomberg Balance of Power on television and on radio. This is Bloomberg Balance of Power on television and on radio. I'm David Weston. We've been watching the markets closely as we will for the entire hour because they have been tumbling the equity markets. And for a report right now, we go to Taylor Riggs. Taylor? Hey, David. Yeah, I wanted to take a look at the S&P 500 because we're now off for a second additional day and with a 3.4% drop or so. We're having the worst day going back in the markets now since Friday of March 20th. There's been a lot of debate going on if the markets had found a bottom or if they think strategists think we could hit a lower low than the previous dip. I was reading a report from TS Lumbar today saying the S&P 500, they expect to drop below 2,000 before we find a real bottom. So they are certainly one of the strategists that are calling for a lower low here if the markets do continue to turn lower. I do want to flip up the board a little bit and take a look at some of the banking stocks that we've been talking about uh, because as you can see there with the 10 year yield, so does go the banking index. We did hear from Wells Fargo bank analyst Mike Mayo uh, uh, today coming out with a report saying he's cutting bank estimates now for a third time, uh, saying that levels are below consensus and he really does see sobering times ahead in the battle of fear and greed. He writes fear has a commanding lead that has driven bank stock valuations down. So he does see perhaps a new opportunity in the next one to two years, but there's going to be significant uh, uh, guidance downward here as we approach some of those levels. Fold that into what it means for some of the uh, FinTech and some of the credit card companies that we've been following. As you can see there, Capital One, for example, Discover Financial, a lot of these are concerns given it's April 1st, and I would argue perhaps more pain ahead on May 1st. Consumers aren't paying their credit cards, and then more importantly, they're not spending, uh, uh, given that there is supposed to be a little bit of a drop here in consumer confidence. And so you are getting some worried uh, for some of the credit card issuers today. Clearly, some of the worst performers here is people either aren't spending or you could look at potentially uh, some defaults coming down the line. Uh, flipping up the board again, finally, David, I was here last night with some of the uh, slew of PMIs came out in Asia. Everyone except for Taiwan was in contraction territory. So as you can see, not a good sign then for some of the metals, particularly copper on no global growth, what that means for copper futures, David. Thank you so much to Taylor Riggs. Coming up here, he is the head of a bank that deals with 66 million individual and small business customers. That is Brian Moynihan. He's the chairman and CEO of Bank of America, and he's going to be here coming up on the program on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Bloomberg Television and Radio, and I am David Weston, and this is Balance of Power. Uh, New Jersey is the state in the union with the second highest number of victims of the coronavirus. Earlier today, I got to talk to its, go his gover the, its governor, he is uh, Phil Murphy of New Jersey, about how his state is coping with the coronavirus. We haven't announced the overnight numbers, David. I, I don't get them in, in, until a little bit after this, but uh, the numbers are clearly going up. 267 precious lives lost, as you mentioned, as of yesterday, almost 19,000 positive tests. The positive test number, frankly, uh, actually both numbers, sadly, we expected and warned people, but the positive test numbers sort of cut both ways. On the one hand, it's positive tests of people who have got the virus. On the other hand, it gives us a much better sense of the dimensions of this, including we've got, you know, we keep now not just positives, but negative testing results as well, and that gives our epidemiologists and the other professionals a better handle on trying to figure out where this is headed and how we can stay ahead of it. 
one of the things we're all looking at is the rate of increase. Do you have any sense, or is it too early to sense, uh, whether the rate of increase is diminishing at all? The rate of increase on positive tests is diminishing, but in fairness, uh, you know, that's a little bit of an imperfect assessment because as much as I want to test everybody, and that was our hope from day one, we just don't have the materials from the feds to be able to do that, both the specimen collecting materials as well as the protective equipment for our health care workers. But the rate is has been flattening uh, as a percentage-wise. Sadly, the number of fatalities, uh, raw numbers and percentages yesterday jumped up uh, again, sadly, uh, I say with a heavy heart, uh, too early to tell. I think one other point, David, that needs to be said is we've been about as aggressive as any American state. The most aggressive set of steps we took were a week ago Saturday, so that's 11 days ago. Some of these uh, testing results that we're getting for, were from specimens that were collected uh, 8 to 10 days ago. So we're not going to have a real handle on the impact of the very aggressive social distancing probably for another week or so. Yeah, Governor, we all know at this point that social distancing seems to be the best weapon we have in the arsenal. At the same time, New Jersey, as I understand it, is the most densely populated state in the nation. What special challenges does that pose for you? Can you monitor the extent to which people are complying? Or for that matter, can you enforce it? Yeah, so we are, David, the, the, the most densely uh, populated state of the nation, which gives us a unique challenge. In, in the north, and you can imagine the north and central part of the states, we're part of metro New York, so we're living the same reality uh, that New York City is. We're sort of all in this together. Um, compliance based on every objective assessment, assessment we have right now is very high. I wouldn't have said that two or three weeks ago, particularly among our young people who, you know, who felt and probably still to some extent feel that they're invincible. Uh, but we, we enforce this aggressively. Uh, we, have the, we have the state police out last night. We've obviously got local and county officials. We, we're finding people, not just hosts, but people who attend any gatherings. We're literally telling people, stay home, stay away from other people, no gatherings, period. And if you violate that, you will pay a big price. That was New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy talking with me earlier today. Coming up here, we're going to talk with Brian Moynihan. He's the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Bank of America has 66 million individual and small business customers. We're going to talk with him about how his bank is coping and what he is seeing out there with the small businesses across the country. Uh, are they going to get relief from that $2 trillion package? And by the way, what was it like to sit next to President Trump last week and talk about this coronavirus? That's all coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The banking system is really at the very heart of our country, our economy, and our lifeblood, really. And Bank of America is a particularly important bank in that process because it has, among other things, 66 million customers who are either individuals or small businesses. So it really knows how the economy is going. We're delighted now to be joined by Brian Moynihan. He's chairman and CEO of Bank of America, coming to us remotely, of course. So, Brian, thank you so much for joining us. This is an economic crisis, but I know you would be the first to say it is first and foremost a personal human crisis. Give us your sense of the of perspective on the overall crisis we're facing. Well, I think it's clear. It's a it's a healthcare crisis. Um, there's a, a this virus out there that there, we're all in a war, and everybody in the world has one con, common enemy, and that's to uh, win the war against this virus. And now that is a human humanitarian crisis, and that there's people that are hit, hit by it and sick, and we got to make sure they're taken care of it, and then we got to take care of the rest of society so they don't get it, which means how you run your company, how you think about how you pull your resources and stuff has changed dramatically over the last few weeks. Have we, have we gotten into social distancing all to stop the virus and win the war on that? When we win that, the economic impact will be mitigated. And that's what you could see in the economy before it, it hit us. And that's what we expect to see in the economy after it hits us. So how have you reordered your priorities at Bank of America? You just said that if you run a company, you have to reorder your priorities for this particular crisis. Give us an example of how you're reordering Bank of America's priorities. Well, we, we took a quick 
uh, look and said, in the end of the day, our response has to be team-centric. In other words, protect our team, get our team in a position so they can support the customers, even if they're working from home. And then it has to be client-centric, what we do for our customers, whether commercial customers or consumer customers, and ultimately, how do we help society? So if you think about the team, you know, the number one issue was how can you – do all the work that we do with this great team working every day across this wonderful platform, but do it in a way that's never been contemplated with 150,000 teammates went from working in the office to working from home across four or five weeks. And, you know, the logistics in that, the network connectivity embedded in that, the ability to distribute calls differently, to have people ultimately ability to trade from home. But on the other hand, we had that 40 or 4,300 branches. We had to keep them open so cash could move in society. We're an essential industry as uh, labeled by the federal government that we have to be open and we have to be able to keep the securities markets open and that takes centralized operations groups. So we had to also reposition how our traders and our teammates in the branches and our teammates in the call centers and our teammates in the operations groups worked at the same time. So we had this massive movement of hundreds of thousands of people to home. At the same time, we had to reposition everybody left to make sure they could operate well. Uh, so so uh, when did it first really sink in with you that you were going to have to do something as dramatic as have 150,000 people work from home? I know we all saw you sit next to the president, on the president's right, when you went down to visit with him. I know you met with some of his staff. Uh, did that help drive home to you just how large this crisis is and it's not going away? Well, I think as we saw, we saw a bit of this set play out in our foreign operations. Those of us, you know, companies like ourselves have operations in, in China and Hong Kong, and the impact in those areas were, you know, first and foremost, gave us a little bit of hint. The belief of what was going to happen in the United States at the time, back in January and you know, early February, was, you know, this was out there and not ours. But as we went through February and we went to some of the – heard Dr. Fauci speak at a conference, and then ultimately we went in the White House in early March, the group of bankers expecting to talk to the president about banking and what we're doing for customers and things like that. You know, suddenly the first thing we did for the half the time was to hear from Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, and the head of the CDC talk about the health care crisis, and that was the night where the president stopped the uh, travel from Europe. And the gravity of the situation when you heard of the impact that the administration was going to have to the economy, which was at that point almost under, you know, linear. You could just extrapolate if you said, I'm going to stop all this movement of people, what will happen? You know, it really settled in on me. And, and, and we were running the company and moving people to work from home. We just said we have to go hard and fast. And, and, and we really quickly moved from sort of alternating shifts and things like that to complete work from the home. And then, you know, then you start to see the human toll start to build up the cases uh, and, the, and the issues of people in hospital and deaths, which are horrible. Brian, as you said, this is first and foremost a health care crisis. At the same time, the best way to fight it is actually to shut the economy down, which does real damage to the economy at the same time. Let's talk about that, in particular, your vantage into that economy through individuals and small businesses. We now have a plan through this CARES plan, the $2 trillion infusion of capital, where a lot of small businesses can get money fast. Is that going to happen? When are you going to be flooded with applications? Well, the, the, let me back up more broadly. So if you think about what we saw in our customer base, as we went through January and February, we saw with our consumers spending money at a much faster rate, a double-digit rate versus 2019. So the economy is probably going to be grow faster than people projected would, would have been my guess. Then as you went into March and you saw the situation, even even with the impact that happened in March, especially in the latter half of March, we'll still, we'll still see our consumer spending in the aggregate in March. And this has cost $3 trillion in a year, so it's not a small sample. Be up for March. Not a lot, but 2 or 3%, something like that. In year to date, it'll be up almost double, you know, high, high single digits. That is faster than last year versus the year before. So the economy is on this path. It just, as you watch March play out, has changed dramatically. So what the the Federal Reserve did is start to a lot of liquidity programs to stabilize the markets. What Congress passed with its stimulus bill is an effort to keep people employed. And so, number one, at Bank of America, we've told our teammates they have a job to year end, which is important. And many other employers have told that. So that to the extent we can keep people employed, keep cash uh, into the household, that'll be terrific and keep a baseline economy growing. The other question is how do you help small businesses do that? And that's the program that's been announced that uh, they're going to implement beginning Friday. The key to that is to how do we get that money out quickly as the bank industry on behalf of, of Congress and the president and the administration. 
and you know they developed a set of regulations. They are coming out, and they're out in process, and they've been published or they're starting to publish them. It'll be we just ask pay, uh, customers to be patient. My advice to customers is to go back to their banking, who they already have a lending relationship with, because the kind of documentation is the kind of documentation you work with those banks. We'll have you know millions of customers come to us, and we'll put them through if they desire into the program, and it'll be very good because they can continue to pay their employees. That's what the money is geared to do, and also cover some overhead, both of which are good things to help these small businesses through this tough time. And we'll do you know we're gonna we're setting up shop and activating thousands of people to be able to take the applications, a huge digital presence. And, you know, I think if everybody can just do it in orderly fashion, it'd be good for, very good for the U.S. economy. In order to get the money out the door, which is what the small business needs to hold badly, because they often don't have the money to keep their employees on payroll, are you willing to take something of a leap of faith? Are other banks willing to take a leap of faith? Because you're going to be have applications that normally maybe you wouldn't give a loan against, but now the government's saying, well, that'll turn into a grant if they keep their employees. Does that work? Do you have enough faith that you'll actually deploy a lot of cash that way? Oh yeah, for the for the clients, it's a it's a straightforward uh, set of needed documents um, that they have to supply. And if they supply those documents, they can get a loan and a, and a calculated amount based on the people they pay in the first couple months of the year. And then they can have a forgiveness to continue the people employed after that. And so for this particular element, it's government guaranteed. So it's not a, it's a government program. And all we are as its banking system, and our coll my peer colleagues and stuff is a, a you know, an implementer of a, of a progress. And let me go to the other side, just so you know, because the strength of our banking system and the capabilities and the capital we've had and built up in the processes, you know, the industry, you know, one of our trade groups announced today, BPI, that the industry had funded more than $400 billion in commercial loans, most of that in the month of March. Bank of America has done $70 billion of loans. Uh, commercial loans in this month still have w way more than our required amount of capital, earn money, et cetera. So it's a pretty interesting thing that the banking industry has been able to step up because of its strength and supply to the SME businesses and even large businesses, the capital, while the government's coming in helping the small businesses, which are the hardest to get the money to. In 2008-2009, the banks were in constant communication with government authorities, whether it was the Fed, whether it was the Treasury or others. Is that going on now? What sort of communications are you having back and forth with the federal government? Well, it depends on the issue, but it, obviously in, the, in terms of the SBA and Treasury program, we, they sought our opinions on how to make sure they could get the money out in an orderly fashion, the right way, and, and carry out uh, you know, Congress's intent and the administration's intent, and so we're heavily involved in that. On some of the liquidity and how the markets are working, my colleague Tom Montag and his team are, are talking to you know, all different parts of the architecture, whether it's the Fed or the Treasury, to talk about what's going on in the markets every, you know, on a given day and where liquidity is needed or where action is needed. And obviously the Fed is talking to us from what are we seeing in the markets, and, and so the OCC and other regulators, uh, you know, what are you seeing from clients? What are, you, what are you hearing out there? Because you want an instant transmission mechanism because a lot of the data people will look at is, you know, is lagging just by definition. It has to be put together and reported. All of us in our own ways are trying to live day to day, week to week, and get through this crisis. Uh, but we, I would like to look forward just a little bit. Some economists are talking about now the possibility of demand destruction, being permanent reduction in consumption because of this crisis. Uh, as you look at it, is there a risk of that? How large a risk is there? You know, at the end of the day, one of the things that uh, is great is if you think about uh, the, the, the throughput of the U.S. economy, um, if we, with the amount of stimulus, the amount of fiscal support that's coming, the amount of monetary support, if you look at economists with their, you know, 25 percent down in the second quarter and then working their way out, the sheer amount of dollars in that at a $5 trillion you know, quarterly economy, $20 trillion a year, is overwhelmed by the amount of support coming to the market. All that is geared to getting us out the other side of this faster. There was no structural issues in the economy. It's a health care crisis, and I think if we mitigate that health care crisis, you will see on the other side of this you know, a, a rebound, and that's what our economists say. So as people have adjusted their second quarter down more due to the unemployment and new claims last week, you know, what people are guessing that will happen this week, you know, there will be a deeper downdraft. But most of the economists that I see and in our internal economists believe on the other side is, is a reversion back to where the economy almost gets back to the same size, you know, at some time in next year that it was prior to this, which is a pretty fast turnaround. And so, you know, I think that that's, that's okay. the core belief because you're not changing anything fundamentally about the business cycle, about what's going on. You're saying if you get by this virus, it works. If you look at China right now, you're seeing the data get stronger. And because the because in 
the fact they're on the other side of a, of this uh, situation, and you're seeing, you know, we're seeing that when I talk to our commercial clients, that you know, their factories that they work with a 65, 70, 75 percent up. We're seeing goods and ship coming out of China, um, and you're seeing those factories start up, and even in some of the places, that, you know, that were most affected, you're seeing people go out and shop. So the question between us and that is going to be when the consumer feels comfortable going out and you know going to a restaurant and going to you know shop at a store and do things like that 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 will come when the healthcare crisis is solved and and that you know obviously there's tremendously talented people and a great healthcare system the best in the world working on that every day and when that happens whatever time that is you know that that's when the behavior will revert back and it's just a matter of how fast we can get there Brian, as chairman and CEO of Bank of America, how do you start to plan about how we do get to the other side of this? You must be thinking already about what's the best way to position yourself to come out the other side. You said already you're going to keep all your employees through 2020 at least. So that's one step in that direction. How are you planning that process? How should we be looking at that? Well, I think, number one, uh, on our employees, teammate side, we've, we basically said all of you have jobs. Don't worry about that. Help us serve our clients. We provided backup child care um, uh, for people so that they could not only uh, because those child care centers to, uh, to close down, people either had to come to work or work from home needed help. So we had them. Um, uh, you know, we, we gave them $100 a day to hire anybody they could to take care of the kids to help. We've increased the minimum wage this month, went up to $20 an hour across our platform. We told our summer kids, which are about uh, you know, 1,800 kids, we said, you all have jobs. Don't worry about it. You'll work 10 weeks. We'll pay for 10 weeks. We'll figure out exactly how we'll conduct that work. We told our permanent employees, you're going to all have jobs. We hired 2,000 plus people during the month of March to keep filling up our client service capabilities, um, and we've repositioned thousands of teammates to help the teammates that are affected by the disease. Um, we took the high care, uh, you know, the high risk people right off the line right away. So we've been doing all this stuff to make sure our teammates have financial security, job security, uh, wage security, and health security. And that was the number one thing. And then behind that, on the clients, the same thing. We basically said to the clients on the consumer side, if you're affected by this virus and if you need to defer a payment, call us up. And we've helped you know, two or 300,000 clients have already called us and taken advantage of the ability to defer a payment. Ultimately, you know, when they get back to work, or they'll catch back up. But the idea is that if, if they are suffering from employment. So on the consumer side, we've done that. On the commercial side, you talked about the government programs. I talked about what we've done overall. But all this comes from the quality that of uh, the enterprise we have. And then it goes to the question of communities. We did $100 million in charitable giving. We, yesterday, to help small businesses, announced a $10 million program to CDFIs for, for their operating expenses and then announced a $250 million capital investment. And what's a CDFI? It's a community development financial institution, which are these local institutions that work with the hardest to, uh, uh, the, the hardest borrowers to work through the process. So we're doing that. So if you think about that, whether it's society in terms of charity, society in terms of supporting small businesses, our own balance sheet and what we're doing in lending, and then what we're doing for our teammates, you know, our job is just to you know, push our, our company in front of this, and that's how we got to do it. All planning for a day when we don't have to be worried about the coronavirus. Thank you so much, Brian. Really appreciate you taking time today. It's Brian Moynihan. He's the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Coming up here, we're going to talk with the governor of Alaska. He's Mike Dunleavy about what Alaska is doing with the coronavirus, how it's responding in his new economic stabilization plan. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Every state in the union now has been affected by the coronavirus, and that does include Alaska, where the governor just today announced a new economic stabilization plan to help combat some of the economic effects from this crisis. We are now joined, I'm pleased to say, by Mike Dunleavy, who is that governor of Alaska. So, Governor, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, give us a sense of where Alaska is. Uh, what, how many incidents do you have? How are you faring with this disease? Very good question. So, so far, Alaska has tested 4,603 individuals. We have 133 positive cases in Alaska. We, um, we've had nine hospitalized, they're still hospitalized in the state of Alaska. And unfortunately, we've had three deaths um, related to Alaskans. And so, uh, uh, you know, we are a small state population-wise, 730,000 people. 
So we want to keep our numbers as low as possible. We have a lot of isolated communities up here, sometimes hundreds of miles from the nearest road. Many of those communities have a, a large Native American population that were impacted by the uh, Spanish flu of 1918. So we're doing everything we can to keep the, this, this virus out of our communities. We're standing up our health care just like the other states are as quickly as possible. And um, we, do have, uh, we do have travel restrictions, and we, do, uh, we are asking Alaskans not to, uh, not to be within six feet of others. And if they can do that and still work, depending upon the type of job, if they can do that and still recreate, we're fine with that. It's a big state with a lot of space. But um, we, are, we are asking folks not to, uh, not to get closer than six feet, wipe every surface there is. But it has had, a, uh, like everywhere else, a detrimental effect on our economy. We've had the highest spike in unemployment claims here in some time. We actually, prior to the virus, just the day before we shut down, our economic indicators were, were going pretty well. We had record low unemployment. We had record investment of billions of dollars. We had um, lowest foreclosure rates in 50 years. Things were going really well. And, of course, like the rest of the world, it was turned upside down. All of us have to take this terribly seriously, and we do, I know, day in and day out. At the same time, it's not too early to think about what comes out the other side, because sooner or later, one way or another, we will get through this. Well, how do you see it up in Alaska? I know you have this economic stabilization plan. Is that to help your industry, your individuals get through the other side? Yeah, very good question. So as, as we know, there's, there's a couple parts of this, this disaster. One is the health side that we're confronting first and foremost in standing up our health care system to deal with this virus. But at the same time, we call that 1A. 1B is stabilizing the economy, because if, we, if this economy falls apart, we're all in trouble for some time. And so the stabilization component, the key to that is really keeping the relationship between the worker and the business, especially the small business. As you know, uh, the hospitality industry, restaurants, bars, hotels, other small businesses have been really hurt by this. And so our plan is to replace that income through the businesses through uh, loans that uh, uh, could, would be zero-interest loans, pretty cheap loans, and make sure that those businesses retain that relationship with the worker so the worker has money, the business has capital to pay rent, move products and services under these conditions that we're operating under now. And then the hope is hopefully sooner than later, I'm not sure when that's going to be, but sooner than later we, uh, we open up this economy more and more and we get people back to work and um, get this thing going again. And finally, Governor, uh, Alaska really is dependent in part on energy. Uh, we've seen what's happened to the price of oil, what's happened to the energy, energy industry. Is that a double whammy for your state? It's going to be a problem. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, it's our understanding that um, uh, just, just this all seemed to happen on the same day. I remember it was a Friday when uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia started this price war. As a result, we saw oil, uh, oil start to, to go down uh, rapidly. And, and steep, so it's now about 20. Uh, uh, ANS is tied to Brent, so we're about 24 bucks a barrel. But there's talk it'll go even lower because of the lack of demand because of the virus, and we're just going to have to prepare for that. Alaska, Alaska throughout its history has gone through a lot: earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, 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 oil price uh, changes, dramatic oil price changes. But um, we're pretty tough, uh, pretty tough crew up here, and um, we're working at uh, working our way through this. So. In the end, it'll be difficult here, you know, in the beginning, but in the end, we're going to come out of this stronger, we believe. Okay, we all wish you well, I know. Okay, thank you so much to Governor Mike Dunleavy of the state of Alaska. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Bloomberg Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, there are new signs today that a nationwide lockdown in Italy may be working. Europe's hardest hit country had 727 new coronavirus deaths in the last 24 hours. That's down more than 100 from the day before and the lowest number in six days. Italy has had more than 110,000 confirmed coronavirus cases. The Italian government will keep its nationwide lockdown in place until at least April 13th. China has been lying about the extent of the coronavirus outbreak in that country. 
Bloomberg has learned that's the conclusion of the U.S. intelligence community in a classified report to the White House. The report found China has been underreporting both total cases and the number of deaths. A Russian military plane loaded with medical equipment is on its way to the United States. President Trump called Russian President Vladimir Putin's offer of help during the coronavirus pandemic, quote, very nice. Russia says it has about 2,800 cases of the coronavirus, but some believe Russia is not being honest about the statistics. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David, back to you. Thank you so much, Mark. Coming up on the second hour of Balance of Power over on Bloomberg Radio, we're going to talk with Jeff Landy. He's the Attorney General of the state of Louisiana, and he signed a letter with 32 other state attorneys general trying to crack down on price gouging by online retailers. This is Bloomberg. 